Hi, <laughs> good evening. Um, I'm super excited to talk tonight. Uh, this is, of course, a subject that has gotten a lot of attention uh, since December um, uh, on the Great Northern Grain Elevator. And I think tonight, you know, um, so much has been written about now and discussed about the history of the building and, and significance. And so uh, the challenge tonight is, is, of course, talking to different people from different backgrounds um, that I hope, you know, for people that know so much about this building already, that might, there might be, <laughs> you know, some kernels of something new, um, certainly in terms of some of the kind of documents and, and research 
research I've been doing around the building, um, but then also for those of you who are unfamiliar with the history that it kind of um, starts to lay that out uh, to begin to contextualize its significance. And I think go beyond just the sort of tradition of, as coming from the discipline of architecture, um, its you know, uh, major implications in the, in the history of, uh, in the evolution of architecture in the 20th uh, century. Um, so I think you know, it's important to contextualize the Great Northern um, as part of this much larger industrial landscape, uh, one that extends all along our waterfronts of Lake Erie, the Buffalo River, and traces of former ship canals, and up the Niagara River to Black Rock and the Tonawandas. Um, and while some of this landscape remains industrial, uh, much of it has and is currently being reconsidered as a new form of cultural landscape connecting our urban neighborhoods to a newly public waterfront defined by the inspired monuments of our industrial past and those laborers who continued its development and success across, uh, uh, contributed to its development and success across uh, so many generations. Uh, but the power of these sites, while certainly renewed in recent years through new economic growth and redevelopment in Buffalo um, that now has a firm hold on the city, has been recognized for the entirety of their histories. Um, thus, this industrial and cultural landscape has forever been a site of cultural interest historically. So here's a couple historic uh, postcards, though I will say of a period when um, every site was interesting for a postcard. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, we also still have the great, our grain elevators featured in postcards today. Um, and so while it is the landscape of concrete silos that we're most familiar with um, at present, the Great Northern stands as a testament to the rich development of the typology and associated uh, innovations in a period of really massive exponential growth of industry and labor in Buffalo. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of grain storage uh, in Buffalo as really it is a kind of story that then echoes across the world um, as we move from the 19th to the 20th centuries. And so uh, really, you know, it's important to start not with just the invention of the grain elevator by Joseph Dart and Robert Dunbar, but in discussing how the, you know, how grain was already being stored in Buffalo after the development of the Erie Canal um, in 1825, um, as we started to import grain uh, first from Ohio um, and move that grain toward the population centers of the East Coast. Um, and so here we see before 1842 in this kind of first couple decades of the Erie Canal's existence, um, the typical kind of three to four story uh, brick uh, warehouse uh, uh, fabric of the area that we now kind of consider canal side and the surrounding context of uh, sort of the foot of Main Street as it meets the Buffalo River. Uh, but of course in 1842 this all changed when we see the emergence of the mechanized grain elevator as a new building typology after this innovation by Dart and Dunbar. Um, and so here's uh, just a uh, drawing. There's a, there is also a model here at the Buffalo History Museum of Dart's elevator and just a diagram of how that works. And of course, you know, the storage of grain is something that also just doesn't start in 1825 to 1842. It is a, it is a thousands uh, year old uh, kind of architectural or building problem. Um, and so there are many precedents for even the vertical storage of grain uh, deeper into history and to antiquity um, and also to across so many different civilizations the world or, uh, worldwide. Um, but it is this moment, of course, in which we see the mechanization, the kind of industrial mechanization of grain storage and grain movement um, uh, through the grain elevator that we get this kind of rapid shift in scale of operations. And so even Joseph Dart's own grain elevator, which uh, at first held 55,000 bushels of grain, um, doubled in size just three years after its initial construction due to all that uh, initial demand. Um, and so out of this really springs this entire new skyline, a city unto itself, of enormous grain elevators um, that sprung up at the edge of Lake Erie and along the Buffalo River and all of the many canals that were cut through that context. And the innovation was really this, you know, mechanical leg that extends down into the hold of the, uh, the ships that carry the grain. Um, and so here we see the unloading of that grain moving up to the top of these massive, you know, largely 10, 12 story uh, wood constructed buildings. Um, and at first darts uh, buckets, these are essentially kind of just buckets uh, on a conveyor belt, on a leather belt um, that then go extend down into the hold and then uh, move the grain up vertically. Um, at first 28 inches apart, holding two quarts each and raising about a thousand bushels an hour. Um, and this completely revolutionized the handling of grain in terms of labor, volume, speed, and thus also economy. Um, Dart tells the story of a schooner, Joe, uh, John B. Skinner, who came into the Buffalo Harbor with 4,000 bushels of wheat in the early afternoon. 
Uh, by early evening, all grain had been unloaded and a ballast of salt loaded for Skinner to return to the port, um, his port in Huron, Ohio, west of Cleveland, about 200 miles, a little over 200 miles. Um, he then loaded back up, returned to Buffalo, unloaded, reloaded, and returned again, that time traveling with vessels that had con with him to Buffalo in the first round. And so two entire rounds of, of transit between, you know, uh, 200 miles apart um, in, uh, because of this innovation um, alongside these uh, pre kind of mechanized grain elevators. And so you can see how this so instantly kind of revolutionized um, the economy of, of grain transshipment and grain storage uh, in Buffalo. And, and this is a technology that really um, remained through even much of the 20th century. And you can see here a more modern photo of, of still uh, kind of scoopers um, and all of this uh, emblematic of this uh, huge influx of, of immigrants in Buffalo uh, that really then fueled the industry, scoopers and stevedores, um, that uh, even though this mechanized process meant significantly reduced labor per bushel, uh, because of the really exponential growth of the industry, we also then had exponential growth of labor uh, associated with that industry. And so by 1900, the period in which we also see this, uh, this photo photograph, um, we actually then have, um, you know, we are at Buffalo is the eighth largest city in the U.S. And so much of that fueled by this industry alongside others, of course. Um, but at the time around 1865, uh, Buffalo was home to 29 elevators, so the first 20 years of their existence, storing about 600,000 bushels of grain. Um, uh, some, I'm sorry, some storing individually 600,000 bushels of grain. Remember, Joseph Dart stored 55,000 initially. Um, altogether, storing 6 million bushels and capable of moving more grain in a single day than Buffalo was able to in an entire year before Joseph Dart's innovation uh, and Robert Dunbar. And it's interesting that in March, on March 13th, 1865, which is 157 years ago, uh, Joseph Dart delivered a talk here, not exactly here in this building because this building didn't exist yet, but he delivered a talk to uh, the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society. Um, and it's this talk uh, that he's actually, it's pretty interesting because this is the full length of the talk um, and he's effectively using this as part of his campaign uh, to patent his invention from 1842, which ultimately is unsuccessful. Um, but he begins the talk uh, by situating the invention of the grain elevator in global terms. And so this was really so early in its history already being situated as, a, uh, as an innovation that was changing the world, not just one uh, for Buffalo. Of course, he's writing about his own influence. <laughs> So, you know, there's a little bit of self-aggrandizement here. Um, but on the other hand, it's really all true um, that this invention, born in Buffalo, would indelibly remain and still does a milestone moment in the paradigm shift from a local and regional food-based economy to a national and international food economy, uh, forever changing the landscape of global food production and consumption, for better or worse. Uh, but it is for this reason and these buildings broader influences that we'll discuss a bit later that the grain elevator remains very arguably Buffalo's greatest contribution to the world, um, at least in terms of direct, you know, kind of tangible, measurable impact at a global scale. Um, and he says this, he kind of opens uh, with this global context and he says, this subject has a, has a bearing not only on the citizens of this community of Buffalo, but also upon an immensely larger number of people whose grain productions are sent and whose bread supplies are received through our hands. The first great care of humans commonly is to produce food, not to know what to do with it when produced. The road from hand to mouth is short and easy enough with humans at first, but as society grows and division of labor is made, producers and consumers of food become widely separated, and the question of transportation becomes exceedingly important. When the hands of producers and the mouths of consumers are distant by the space of half a continent and even half a globe, the road from hand to mouth is a long one, and oftentimes a hard road to travel. Whatever smooths the roughness of that road cheapens food and benefits humankind. And so kind of laying this innovation out in global terms for the larger benefit of the affordability also of, of food. And of course, we could talk about the other kind of ramifications of that, but um, interesting to see how he lays this out. Um, and while he makes no mention of Robert Dunbar, who was the, engineer, the mechanical engineer who actually made Dart's concept possible, um, he, uh, he's, he does not take full credit for the inception of, of this invention. Rather, he positions it uh, as a clear and decided direct evolution of Oliver Evans's patented 18th century elevator and conveyor system for manufacturing flour. 
but also Oliver Evans before him had been successful in his quest to uh, um, receive a patent, uh, even with the um, argument against by Thomas Jefferson at the time. Um, and so I think also positioning himself within the context of Oliver, Ev Oliver Evans is another argument for this uh, patent attempt. Uh, but the distinction he offers as part of this ultimately unsuccessful attempt to obtain a, a patent um, is in the new application of this um, elevator and conveyor system as a, quote, commercial rather than a manufacturing appliance for facilitating the transshipment of grain, noting that some of the most useful inventions have not been discoveries of new principles or methods of mechanical action, but new applications of methods and principles already known. Um, and so, you know, from, and, and of course from Evans Elevator, this is still an old idea that we can trace back thousands of years, uh, which is why Thomas Jefferson argued against Evans in his quest for a patent. Um, but interesting to also think of, you know, this moment. So while there arguably had been this invention previously, it certainly is this moment of darts innovation that then kind of offers that back to the world and changes this landscape of production uh, and consumption. Um, and, and he says this, an inventor's merit consists not merely in conceiving of an idea of a machine, but also in overcoming the practical difficulties in its successful operation. And certainly um, that is what happened here in Buffalo. And so, um, and, and so we have, you know, in 1825, the opening of the Erie Canal. Uh, in its first 10 years, we see annual receipts of grain handled in Buffalo totaling 112,000 bushels. Um, a year later, we already see that jumping to 500,000. This is pre Dart and Dunbar's grain elevator in invention. Um, but 1841, then the year before uh, uh, 1842, the year uh, Dart and Dunbar invent the grain elevator, annual receipts are already 2 million. So we can see that uh, Dart and Dunbar were responding to this already immense growth um, and labor that was concentrated at uh, uh, the commercial slip and the uh, uh, associated slips around uh, the outlet of the Erie Canal, or the kind of entrance to the Erie Canal uh, from the lake. But then we see 1862, 20 years after after um, Dart and Dunbar's invention, uh, annual receipts up to 70 million bushels uh, of grain. And so we really see this kind of exponential growth um, of scale jump from um, uh, at that point in time. And I think also then what's amazing about this moment is that this prophecy of Joseph Ellicott's also comes true. Joseph Ellicott, of course, who laid out Buffalo circa 1800, um, that uh, where we see Ellicott actually, you know, laying out a canal district, which is often left out of some of the reproduced early kind of Joseph Ellicott era drawings of 1804, 1805. Um, and so here we see in this earlier map of 1800, this kind of vision for a canal district because conversations about the Erie Canal had already been discussed for, uh, for many decades, as early as 1724 by that time. Um, and so 1872, we see this really um, uh, intense you know, canal district in all of these industries. This just one side of the Buffalo uh, Harbor um, uh, centered around commercial slip and the um, gate of the Erie Canal. And so uh, some of, you know, here's uh, some of the wooden grain elevators then that are springing up and really changing this landscape in this period between 1842 and as we close on the 19th century. Uh, and it's really just a kind of incredible uh, scene. Um, but another interesting inclusion in his talk was this chart, which is really just an accounting of all 29 existing grain elevators in 1865 um, that had been constructed in that first 20 years since his own. Uh, but what it also reveals rather explicitly, although is not the point of this, um, and, and no mention certainly is made in the text, is one of this, the going typology of these wooden elevators' biggest problems, that it was inherently defective as a means of grain storage. Um, not only did the wooden construction of these buildings offer a breeding ground for vermin and rot, uh, they were incredibly susceptible to total destruction by fire, uh, which was really an unfortunate inevitability due to the high combustibility of grain, and when you pair that with the electrical process of its transfer as introduced by Dart and Dunbar. And so what we can highlight here is all of these grain elevators that burned, uh, that were destroyed in this first 20 years as a kind of implicit, you know, explicit, but, uh, you know, um, not meant to be the point of this graphic um, that really kind of highlights also an inherent problem in the existing kind of architectural typology of this uh, kind of first generation of mechanized grain elevator. Even uh, at, uh, a little bit later, this is 1895, so we're getting close to the Great Northern here of 1897. Uh, this was Buffalo's largest ele elevator upon completion for its time the Eastern Elevator, uh, which was built of eight million board feet of timber, 
Um, it was destroyed by fire just four years after its completion. <laughs> so kind of unreal. Um, and it's often quoted that the kind of average lifespan for these wooden buildings was about 12 years before it sort of was inevitable that, um, that these would break out in fire and be destroyed. And so uh, oh, you know, uh, all the, of these kind of owners uh, were constantly rebuilding and rebuilding um, these buildings and ultimately insurers became increasingly um, you know, skeptical of insuring these properties as they were losing out quite a lot. Um, with the inevitable destruction of these buildings. And so then we enter this kind of transitional era of grain elevator development in Buffalo. And, um, and it's interesting because Buffalo then has some really rich examples of this moment, this kind of period of about really less than two decades, but 1890s to the first decade of the 20th century, uh, where, um, uh, where these industrialists were experimenting with other forms of construction, both for uh, really kind of centered around the, um, um, the fire protection you know, of these buildings, but also in doing so, solving other problems of the storage of grain. And so we also see then examples where, you know, and so we, these are three different examples all in Buffalo, uh, an example that exists uh, in Tile, uh, at the, today what's uh, part of General Mills, um, an example that no longer exists with exposed steel cylinders uh, as silos, and then also, of course, the grain Northern as part of this transition, which actually embeds these cylindrical silos within this larger brick box. And thus, if you've heard of it, referred to as a brick box elevator. Um, that's the concept. And so this takes us to the Great Northern uh, of 1897. Um, and at this point, because the wooden silos, one, largely didn't serve, you know, didn't survive because of their own um, you know, susceptibility to fire, but also then because by this time it was just in nature then to uh, also rebuild in these new fireproof forms. And so the Great Northern remains still um, as not only the oldest of all remaining, but also an entirely unique and individually significant structure. Um, in 1901, Engineering News cited the Great Northern specifically as one of the best and most important engineering works of modern times. Today, the building stands as possibly the only remaining of its type and construction in the entire world. Um, it was put, in, the building, here's another image, the building was put into service uh, in, on September 29th, 1897, and this photograph is from the first year of its opening, from the first three months of its opening. Um, and when the Great Northern was completed, it was the largest grain elevator in existence in the entire world, uh, with a total storage capacity of up to three million bushels, generally two and a half to three million bushels. Um, and so, just to put it, this in scale, uh, just of half a century earlier to Dart and Dunbar's uh, first elevator, um, Dart and Dunbar's elevator, there would have to, uh, 54 of those would fit inside this one single building of the Great Northern. Um, and what it does is then it substitutes steel for wood in the construction of its bins, uh, which are all cylindrical steel containers, you'll see another image in a bit, uh, held within this brick wall, this brick container, which is really just the kind of fireproofing mechanism to protect the silos inside. Um, the entire building is of steel construction, steel frame construction, and so literature of the time also cited this brick as a brick curtain wall. I know you don't often think of brick as a curtain wall uh, material, but that's really what it was in its conception and still today in its material performance. And so really this is a curtain walled building, um, just a curtain wall of brick. Um, it's a 400 foot long building. The enclosing walls are 100 feet, but that goes up to about 100, over 160 feet with the head house or the cupola. Um, this is the plan, which I think is like one of the most beautiful plans in the history of architecture. <laughs> it, is, it is just incredibly, I mean, just the kind of geometric patterning and the rigor of that geometry and also the kind of multiple scales in which these silos exist within this larger brick box uh, to try to use and take advantage of all of these spaces and this negotiation between the, the circle and the rectangle, right, and this kind of grid of these bins. There are 30 primary bins, each 38 foot diameter and 70 feet in height. There, there are then two rows of nine, so 18 total in between those that are kind of these interstitial bins, um, plus then 18 exterior small bins uh, of about 10 foot diameter for a total of 66 bins. Um, that makes for this combined capacity of 3 million bushels. Uh, and with the use of its three marine towers, um, there are only two today, um, this building was capable of elevating 60,000 bushels of grain per hour. Again, to put that in context to Dart's initial grain elevator, he was elevating a very proud 1,000 bushels of grain per hour. So 60 times the loading um, and unloading um, you know, capacity in a, in a given hour. Kind of amazing. And on Christmas Day of, of 1897, just three months after the building's completion and beginning operation, it made the cover of Scientific American. 
Um, and so these first two pages are entirely written about the Great Northern Grain Elevator and this innovation in Buffalo. Um, and it really goes into such great detail about all of these engineering innovations, including um, also the you know things that I've already mentioned, of course, but also the fact that the building had the largest conveyor belts in the world at the time of its construction. It had a double system of dust collectors upstairs and down, which was an entirely new and never before used method and scale of dust collection, all also for the purpose of, of fireproofing. It had brushless motors with no sliding electrical contacts to ensure absolute sparkless running um, and all electrically powered through uh, the power of Niagara Falls. Um, and so, and it's interesting just to look at the 1899, the uh, Sanborn fire insurance map, where we see, uh, and I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these maps, but they, all of the buildings for fire insurance purposes are, are co color coded based on their construction and thus also implications about fireproofing or lack thereof. And so yellow is wood construction, pink is masonry. Um, uh, and then we also have you know, some with stone, other veneers like stone, or also you have uh, steel. Um, but the Great Northern is brown. And what brown just means is, doesn't matter what it's made of, it's fireproof. <laughs> So uh, kind of amazing. And a special note there that's not often included about also harnessing the power of Niagara Falls. Um, and so there we have it. Uh, in engineering news, I mentioned in 1901, um, in an article called Fireproof Grain Elevators in America, written by John Kennedy uh, of the American Society of Civil Engineering, uh, he discusses the Great Northern at great length and compares construction costs and insurance costs between wooden and fireproof grain elevators. And I think what's also important here is the implication that this had not only on the owners of the buildings, but also on those people that owned the grain. Um, because you would also have to insure the grain, um, and the insurance rate for the grain being stored was also based on the facilities that you were, you know, um, uh, storing those grain, you know, hiring to store the grain. And so actually, uh, for the insurance, not actually, it was cited that that insurance was not even needed for this building. Um, uh, even if, you know, of course, it might be required by banks and other, um, other entities, um, that really it was so surely fireproof that why would you even really need insurance? Uh, but also that the grain owners, the grain shippers, um, would then see a cost savings of over 80% um, in the insurance of the grain because it was being held in a, um, a fireproof building. So it's just interesting to think about all the economical, you know, payoffs of the Great Northern in particular and, and how it made these really kind of uh, um, highly regarded national outlets uh, for, you know, highlighting um, all that it was doing and kind of, re, you know, establishing this new paradigm shift in grain elevator construction in 1897. Um, and so we go from also at this time period uh, handling a total of 70 million bushels to in 1891, pre, you know, prior to the Great Northern, jumping to 128 million. Uh, 1898, we're already at 221 million. Um, and, um, and so there's this, you know, just again, part of this exponential rise. Uh, what I also love about the, uh, this Scientific American article is the two photographs, or this uh, photograph and lithograph, uh, that they include in the cover. And so, because it reveals this, uh, what lies, you know, inside of this building, that there's actually this really interesting hybrid construction model um, that reveals kind of more clearly than any other grain elevator I've come across this transitional concept and, and moment in grain elevator development. Because from the outside, it actually looks a lot like the previous generation of wood constructed elevators. And so here's this, uh, the Bennett elevator, which was actually built on top of the site of Joseph Dart's former elevator, which burned in 1963. Um, and so, uh, and you can see it's really the same exact form that we recognize in the Great Northern. Um, and so we see that wooden, the kind of uh, evolution of the wooden form kind of pull forward in the construction of the Great Northern, even if it swapped its materials for an iron frame, uh, steel frame, and also its uh, brick curtain wall. Um, but on the inside, we have the steel cylindrical bin construction which reveals an entirely new logic of bin geometry, materiality, and organization, as we're also increasing the kind of linear organization of these as we now have these linear transfer systems also embedded in the cupola or the head house. Um, and this looks really strikingly familiar to what we know is coming after, which is the advancement of the concrete slip form construction grain elevator. And here's, of course, the American grain elevator, uh, which is our earliest, this half here, our earliest in 1906 uh, concrete um, uh, constructed elevator. This back half uh, is from 1931. And of course, ultimately to something like Concrete Central, which is uh, uh, ultimately our, our largest, our longest uh, grain elevator, uh, which is a quarter mile long with a total storage capacity of four and a half million bushels. Again, Great Northern is three million. 
and was also then the largest grain elevator in the world at the time of its construction. So, uh, so really then we kind of firmly, um, and so clearly through the Great Northern, what we see is the kind of direct translation uh, from the previous generation to the new generation when we, when we see these two images in, in, con in concert of the exterior and the interior logic of its construction. Um, and so ultimately in the 1930s, we really reached the kind of peak of our grain handling in Buffalo with about 300 million bushels processed annually, uh, but also at this time when we become the world's lar or the, um, the nation's largest flour producer and really take over from Minneapolis. And so this is actually an article written in 1932 by a woman named Laura O'Day, who visited Buffalo and wrote this article in the journal Economic Geography, um, titled Buffalo as a Flour Milling Center, and basically laying out all the reasons, which are many, uh, and this is not the full length of the article, this is just the first three pages, um, as to why Buffalo was emerging as the leading flower producer um, in, the, in the country, uh, if not also kind of taking over at a much larger scale. And so here's some of the diagrams from that, in including where the wheat was being grown at the time. Wheat was actually the 75% uh, of the grain that was moving in 1930 uh, was wheat. And so, uh, so here we have all of the wheat growth and in, uh, dipping into Canada, of course, but all of this primarily moving to the Great Lakes um, and across the Great Lakes to Buffalo. And this is actually, there's a, she has a kind of redrawn, updated version of this uh, diagram, this map-based diagram from 1923. And I think it's so interesting because I think it really puts us in the context of the Great Lakes where you can see uh, grain being brought from, you know, the kind of upper Midwest um, and beyond into Canada, um, and then also kind of being all being loaded up onto these large ships and then uh, traversing the Great Lakes. But what's I think amazing is how you see it ends in Buffalo. It's not about passing through Buffalo. It actually is that so much of this also ends in Buffalo because when we're storing so much grain, it means that that grain was being processed. And so we have these flour mills where we're turning that grain into a product um, that is going to market. And so ultimately we have that being distributed by rail, by canal still, uh, also some deviated up to, you know, uh, up through Canada and so forth. Um, uh, but Buffalo really as this kind of end point uh, which is interesting. And so there's really these kind of sister cities on the Great Lakes. So we have Buffalo, of course, where the grain elevator was invented. Um, these are current city and metro population statistics just to give you a sense of scale of some of these places. Um, but at the other end, we have these kind of sister cities of Duluth, Minnesota, and Superior, Wisconsin, which kind of have one large port area, even though separate. Um, so it's really one port in two cities that bridge two states. Um, and then also Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, and you notice though, also the, the difference in population. Of course, our population was more than twice this amount at one point in time. But, uh, but all of this, you know, because the, the grain was leaving here. It was about loading and leaving. Whereas in Buffalo, it was about um, importing and then using, and then also uh, trans, you know, continuing the transshipment. Um, but these, uh, and so a couple of the reasons that I think that don't get discussed as much about why Buffalo was so critical in this larger context uh, as the terminus for grain movement on the Great Lakes is also then because the quality, basically people in Buffalo, millers in Buffalo then, had their, all of this grain is being collected from Duluth Superior, from Thunder Bay, from Chicago, right? From all of these secondary uh, locations along the Great Lakes, all of that grain essentially is coming to Buffalo, which meant if you were milling in Buffalo, you had your choice of all of the top grains from the entire, you know, vast, you know, uh, regions of, of, of wheat growth across the US and Canada. And so it was really the place to, you know, where you had the kind of most potential to create the highest quality products. Um, and that, I think, is super interesting and why ultimately Minneapolis, you know, we see this kind of crossover, this handoff from Minneapolis to Buffalo in terms of, of, of flour production. Um, also then, Buffalo offered the lucrative process, uh, prospect of returning west with a full load of cargo. Um, and both in the form of package freight from the east, the east coast, and also in anthracite coal. And so we don't often talk about coal as a really important part of our history, but actually half of all, more than half, 53%, in 1928, of all anthracite coal shipped from Pennsylvania uh, was shipped to Buffalo. Um, and so we actually ranked as the city of leading export, as the leading export center for anthracite coal. So, uh, which is, again, in a kind of another piece of the context that I think we kind of miss in connecting also with that, mar with that kind of very different industrial history in Pennsylvania. Um, but then also, uh, a byproduct of the industry of flour milling is feed. Uh, 
and there was an enormous market for feed in, um, in, the, uh, in the East, in New England, New York, and Pennsylvania, because that is uh, a large portion of the Amer what's considered the American da Dairy Belt. And so, uh, so all of these things kind of come together that really cement Buffalo, um, and as Laura O'Day also situates Buffalo as this really important, um, you know, this, this kind of nexus of, of all things to be considered in the economy of grain movement. Um, here's just an image of the port at Duluth uh, in Superior. And it's interesting when we broaden then to think about this context of, you know, grain being loaded into Duluth Superior and then coming to Buffalo, companies, including the Great Northern, had operations in both cities. And so a sister grain elevator to our Great Northern here in Buffalo, the Great Northern S, exists uh, and was built in 1900 to 1901 in Superior, Wisconsin. And it looks remarkably like our great northern here in Buffalo. So we have a kind of sister building in that context. Uh, but before you think that it is, you know, that makes our building less special, because this actually does also still exist. In fact, Great Northern S is, is also still currently operational. Um, it's actually, while it looks very similar, it's a very, very different building in terms of its architecture. It's actually not cylindrical bins on the interior, but instead kind of more like the wooden forebears rectangular bins uh, divided into this space. And it's not a brick box, but instead it's iron clad. Um, and so also a different point, but also maybe more readily understood as curtain wall here and non-structural, which has been a big misunderstanding uh, in the current condition of the Great Northern in terms of the hole in the brick construction um, that is not part of, uh, not a real structural problem for the building. Um, and so we've got these two great northern buildings uh, at either ends of the Great Lakes that kind of are talking to each other literally in the passage of grain uh, across the Great Lakes. And here's also an image then of Thunder Bay. Um, and it's interesting because both the cases of Duluth Superior and Thunder Bay, its organization, I'd equate it more to our outer harbor and some of the grain elevators that sit on our outer harbor. Um, uh, but I think that also marks what makes Buffalo really special is because we both have this kind of scenario at the lakes with the outer harbor and then we have this real density that is moving up the rivers. And so we have this really interesting irregularity as the river snakes through the fabric of the city, um, where this landscape really integrates with the fabric of Buffalo in a very unique way that's di very in entirely different from this industrial landscape as a situation in these two sister cities, which actually each have about the same number of extant grain elevators as we do in Buffalo, um, Thunder Bay and Duluth Superior. Um, and this is a map from 1939, and you can see just the density of all of these um, grain elevators and other larger industries uh, along this and landscape, but also extending out um, to the outer harbor. Um, and so, you know, all of this makes up this very familiar, what's now very familiar landscape of these grain elevators kind of working their way up and in, in more relation to urban neighborhoods in the city. Um, but the Great Northern, you know, I think, you know, so uh, I just want to talk a little bit more about the building in this context. Um, you know, so it is part of this larger landscape where you can see, you know, there's this relationship both to water then and to rail uh, because grain different. This is one thing I learned. I'm going to go back a few slides just to show something really briefly. You know, I when I first looked at this building, I thought naively. I thought, oh, it must have lost its marine towers. And of course, that's probably a product of the fact that this technology has evolved. And, and so we have a different system here. Well, actually, this building, Great Northern S, never had marine towers because you would never be unloading grain from this grain elevator, which is an interesting difference. You're always loading um, uh, grain. And so you do have other ways. So rail, you know, you would unload grain from rail cars, but you'd never be loading into lake vessels, effectively. You'd never be loading a ship uh, with, uh, with grain. And so a very interesting difference in the kind of engineering and mechanics for these different kind of two ends of uh, the lake. And so, uh, so it's also special in Buffalo then that we have you know, kind of both these processes of, of loading and unloading that's happening uh, uh, through, you know, as uh, related to water, um, but also then to rail and, and all producing this really intense irregular landscape, again, that is markedly different and kind of striking uh, from these other contexts um, elsewhere on the Great Lakes. 
Um, and of course, you know, I think it's also important to acknowledge this, uh, this you know, extending beyond the kind of engineering uh, and innovation, mechanical, and, you know, uh, in terms of also labor as it, as it uh, affects, you know, the city, that these buildings were then also really influential to an entire generation of European modern architects um, as really these, you know, not only marvels of industry and engineering, but buildings that also had this really powerful architectural uh, scale and these kind of effectively great monuments of architecture even though they weren't really designed as such. They were designed not by architects, but by engineers. Um, and so these buildings, along with their Daylight Factory counterparts, went on to inspire an entire, this entire generation of architects. Here, one of the most iconic buildings of the 20th century, the, um, the House of the Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier. And so, uh, but it's, and you can start to even see when you look at these buildings through that lens, you can start to see kind of references to the very similar forms uh, that we're familiar with here in Buffalo, like the curved top to this roof garden at the Villa Savoie, that seems to kind of echo some of the forms that were being admired by Corbu um, and other architects before him. In fact, Corbu was really borrowing from uh, Walter Gropius, and Gropius had in 1911 um, given a lecture um, that was uh, full of all of these slides that he had collected. He never visited Buffalo or uh, these cities. Actually, ultimately, Gropius would uh, immigrate to the U.S., but at this point in his life, he had never visited Buffalo uh, or these American cities, the North American and also South American. Um, but what we notice, actually, is you know, our Buffalo grain elevator complex is included in this uh, lecture um, by someone who would ultimately go on to be one of the most famous architects of this generation in Europe. Um, it's interesting because Gropius would have been more in, in, in touch with this as an architectural um, kind of pursuit because he had worked previously for an architect, uh, Peter Behrens, who was designing factory buildings and industrial buildings in Berlin. Um, and then he himself started his career by designing factories. This is the Fogesberg, uh, which is a factory that produces shoe loss or the molds for, uh, for shoe making um, that is uh, still in operation by the same company in Allfeld in Germany, uh, but went on to translate those ideas uh, and kind of lessons from factories and, and grain elevators um, in maybe one of his most, if not, of course, his most in, kind of um, imageable and, and celebrated building, the Bauhaus. He was the director of the Bauhaus and really established that as a program in um, this is the building in Dessau. And so these slides from 1911, uh, from a decade and a half previous, you can see that kind of direct inspiration of these grain elevators and daylight factories. Um, and really the assertion here, as he then went on to publish this as an article, which includes seven full pages of images of grain elevators, including here's the Dakota and Buffalo, um, was really that America, you know, the Americas, not Germany, was the industrial motherland of the world. Um, and that was a pretty bold assertion in 1913 Germany, uh, if we think about what's, what's to come. Um, and it's Corbu that then uh, lifts all of Gropius' images and then republishes them in his book, uh, Towards a New Architecture, uh, which is 1923, then published in English in 1927. Um, and so here we see all the same familiar images, including the Dakota and Buffalo, and what really becomes a kind of, you know, one of the most um, canonic texts of the 20th century in architectural development, and certainly in the Western world. Um, but also, just a quick note, notice that he actually pre-Photoshop edits a lot of the buildings uh, to remove some of the kind of seemingly historicized language. So what could be read as little pediments, he's clipping those off of these photographs so that this notion of the form, the kind of beauty and elegance of this kind of pure notion of form following function was as clear as an argument as, as, as ever possible. And so interesting to see the borrowing but then slight evolution of, of the architecture in uh, Corbu's argument. And he says, and this is really as a kind of scathing critique to architects, he says that there is one profession and one only, namely architecture in which progress is not considered necessary, where laziness is enthroned, and in which the reference is always to yesterday. And he says, thus we have the American grain elevators and factories, the magnificent first fruits of the new age. The American engineers overwhelm with their calculations of our, Europe's, expiring architecture. <laughs> 
They're kind of amazing. And so this continues on as the kind of, you know, uh, as this source of inspiration for these architects. And so Gropius goes on to publish in 1925 this book called International Architecture. So another kind of um, name for this period, the international style, um, as an architecture that through its interest in form, folly, and function kind of superseded kind of um, notions, specific notions of the history of place. Um, and again, for better or worse, but, uh, but in this catalog, uh, this kind of full comprehensive catalog, which is sort of then a precursor to maybe what becomes more famous, uh, Philip Johnson uh, and Henry uh, Russell Hitchcock's um, uh, uh, book that comes in 1932. Uh, that uh, what we see are all of these examples of European architects practicing this modern international architecture. But interestingly, he intermixes grain elevators into that. And so, uh, and here actually on one spread, what we have is the Larkin Administration Building, of course, unfortunately now lost here in Buffalo, uh, but alongside an image of a grain elevator, this one in Minneapolis. But so you get this pairing um, to start to have this kind of conversation across um, you know, uh, architecture by architects, but then also these works of engineering. Um, and then how we kind of turn the pages through to see also unbuilt proposals, uh, but then flip back ultimately to more grain elevators and, and, and factories. And so there's this kind of intermixing of uh, um, uh, of the of these buildings um, and it's Eric Mendelssohn is actually the only one of these architects that actually visits Buffalo and so in 1924 he comes to Buffalo on this big trip to then study these buildings that he had been sketching this sketch is not from ex being in front of a grain elevator it's from the photographs that were being published um, by gen by the you know other architects of the time um, and notice really timely with, uh, with uh, Gropius writing and talking about uh, the grain elevators. And so he ultimately does come to the US, publishes this book called America, a picture book of an architect, um, which, do, which uh, includes his photographs and experiences. Here's two grain elevators from his time in Buffalo and really writes these uh, beautiful feverish letters home um, about what he's seen. And you can just kind of sense that enthusiasm. Concrete Central was then included in Bruno Taut's book, Modern Architecture. And then of course that takes us to a, a later you know, a kind of generation in 1940, where even kind of as modernism is, is really well established, uh, we have here in the Albright Knox in, in Buffalo, Henry Russell Hitchcock and also uh, Gordon Washburn um, uh, working on the, you know, the um, ex exhibition Buffalo Architecture in 1860 and 1940, of course, the subject of interest in the Linz's exhibition of which this talk is a part of. And so, um, and here, as, as Jesse also mentioned, I just wanna read what uh, Hitchcock says about um, what's, what's now known as the Cargill Pool Elevator, but at the time was the Saskatchewan Pool Elevator. And he says, he really cites this as the finest of all grain elevators in Buffalo, both because of its isolated site and intrinsic excellence. And he says, such utilitarian structures set an architectural standard for this century, which few architects and more conventional buildings have ever approached. And again, as a kind of attribute of Buffalo. And this continues to be, you know, and, and another really important example that intersects Buffalo directly is, is Rainer Banham's revisit to these sites, you know, a couple generations later in 19, as he teaches here actually at the University of Buffalo, in 1976 to 1980, uh, where he kind of follows in the footsteps, so to speak, even if not literally, of the modernist architects to revisit these buildings and also discover some of the sort of untold truths behind them as it relates to industry, uh, labor, um, and also kind of curiosities in building form that don't fit the mainstream narrative of, the, of architects of that generation. But we see all through the 20th century, here's one of my, this is probably my favorite example of, of how literal sometimes the grain elevators were, were quoted in, in architecture. This is on Andre Lersat, a French architect. Um, this is a building in, that still stands today in, in Vienna, Austria. And you can see here, it's a residential complex. Um, but, and actually if, if this photograph were, you know, if you take about, you know, four steps to the left, you have this magic moment where all of those, what are the stair towers for access to the apartment units um, align. And so you just get this kind of unbroken, unpunched line of these white cylinders, just like a grain elevator in Buffalo, just like the American, for example, in Buffalo. Um, but what's interesting, so there you see the stair towers that produce those. Um, on the back side, the language is flipped. And so it's a, it's a daylight factory. And so you really have the direct merging, one side grain elevator, the other side daylight factory to produce this kind of new idea, uh, new concept in housing. But the grain elevator is, is a kind of language that then sustains in its references here, Louis Kahn uh, practicing in, in Bangladesh and, um, um, in 19, this building was completed in 1983 at the National Assembly, where still, again, we still see these kind of striking quotations and also how it intersects the history of art 
And so here we have um, a depiction of Minneapolis, but also these images that look very familiar to us in Buffalo, um, taken uh, in the kind of canon of, of 20th century art history. And even uh, more recently, 2003, this catalog of grain elevators, including one in Buffalo, unfortunately no longer in existence, the H.O. Oates complex. Um, and so it's the sum total of all of this uh, that not only makes the grain elevator a tremendously special and unique contribution to the history of the world um, in the modern era, but that also makes Buffalo, in particular, one of the most important cities in the world for its extant collection of grain elevators, compounded, of course, by the fact that the story of the grain elevator is so firmly rooted here with its birth in 1842. Um, and it's in this context that the Great Northern stands as, again, the oldest surviving example and possibly only of its type um, and one of true absolute innovation for its time. Not to mention its undeniable monumental power in form and scale and material expression uh, in its kind of purity uh, and for its uh, site on the city ship canal and also in complement to the later uh, adjacent mill daylight factory complex. Uh, in the years 1990 to 91, the Historic American Engineering Record, which is a federal record established by the National Park Service, uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers, and the Library of Congress, uh, produced a, a hundreds pages long detailed report on uh, the grain elevators of Buffalo, including um, the Great Northern and 19 other extant grain elevators. And the, the quote from this report, which is of course a federal uh, level report, uh, says, directly, the grain elevators of Buffalo comprise the most outstanding collection of extant grain elevators in the U.S. and collectively represent the variety of construction materials, building forms, and technological innovations that revolutionize the handling of grain in this country. And I think that second part of that statement is, is almost not true if, if the Great Northern is not included in that context, because the Great Northern is more than any other emblematic of this evolution of technological innovation um, that's discussed here in the Hare Report. Um, and so they also then document these buildings um, and include also kind of, you know, draw architectural drawings um, and uh, again, pay much attention to the Great Northern. Uh, and they're really fabulous drawings because they also go to great uh, lengths to explain how these work as effectively machines, machines at the scale of, you know, a cathedral. Um, and, uh, and I think, though, this is a table then from the Hare Report, and this breaks down also the, these generations of elevators. Um, but what's important, if we look at this list of extant elevators uh, included in the Hare Report, we've already lost more than 25%, more than a quarter, of the elevators that existed in 1990, 1991. So I know sometimes it feels like, well, we've got a lot of these buildings, right? Um, but when you slowly start to eat away one by one at this collection and start to look at across the decades, you know, we're now at over a quarter loss of this collection. And if we lose the Great Northern, uh, we'd be at almost a third um, loss uh, of these extant silos. Uh, and of course, that brings us to, you know, the current condition of the building after the windstorm on December 11th. Uh, 2021. Um, and so it's, it's, it's present and its future are very much in jeopardy and, and currently in limbo, despite being owned by a Fortune 500 company with annual profits in the billions who acquired the property after it was locally landmarked in 1990 and thus knew its obligations to maintaining this building. Uh, but I think what's also important is to understand that this is not the first time this has happened in this building. <laughs> and so maybe some of you have seen this photograph. This is 1907 after a windstorm. Um, and, uh, and it looks, it's, you know, strikingly eerie uh, when we look at this next to an image today. Uh, but I do think it's also interesting. And so this building is in a location that is, of course, susceptible to some of the most intense winds in the city. And, and it's a large masonry wall that, um, um, that you know, uh, is, you know, I think that, you know, this was a big experiment. And we should also understand this, this building in the context of this large uh, new material experiment that was the Great Northern. Um, but it was quickly fixed after this. And so we also, what this also proves is that what has happened today is actually, you know, it's fixable, right? Uh, of course, there are differences in cost and labor and, all, and also utility, um, but nonetheless, no one can argue that it's not fixable. Um, and it's interesting just to uh, look at the Buffalo Courier from the next day, January 21st, 1907, in which the damage was cited as not heavy. And so here we have uh, these two events, uh, 1907 and 2021. This is just note, actually, this is on the other side of the building. So uh, this was on the south uh, facade, and this, of course, is on the north-facing facade. 
Um, but it's, I think in this context of the Great Northern's unique significance and the kind of prescient topic of its, its preservation and its future, that we also start talking about the Great Northern for its commanding position in the heart of this much larger landscape of industrial, cultural, technological, architectural, environmental, um, human and labor, and ecological heritage. Uh, one that stretches not only up the Buffalo River and the City of Ship Canal, but also forms contiguous with that of the entire Outer Harbor, running along the shore of Lake Erie, all the way through Tiff Nature Preserve, uh, to the Union Ship Canal, Lackawanna Canal, and former site of Bethlehem Steel. This is all one landscape. When all considered together, in the Great Northern, the oldest of, of all of these, and in uh, in, in, in somewhat most significant in that context, um, this vast site is one beyond compare and one that transforms some of our biggest kind of quote unquote eyesores uh, into our single's greatest cultural and civic asset in Buffalo. Um, and so I really believe that the Great Northern will play uh, this pivotal role in this context as a gateway landmark um, and a place to tell this story, to share this story of our own history um, as, um, you know, and this extensive site's most historic structure um, as a starting point in, in sharing this story of innovation with the world. And here we see just an image of some of that much larger landscape, including Tift, including Bethlehem Steel, Union Ship Canal, uh, the Buffalo River, and all the way out uh, through the Outer Harbor. Um, and thus, I think the Great Northern also rises far beyond its local landmark status as a key contributor to a larger industrial landscape of UNESCO World Heritage Site eligibility through at least three criteria. Um, and those are as follows, that the Great Northern and its companion structures exhibit an important interchange of human values over a span of time and within a cultural area of the world on developments in architecture and technology. That also the Great Northern and its companion structures bear a unique and exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition central to a modern and global civilization. These are all in the words of UNESCO that you can apply uh, that seem very apt here. And thirdly, that the Great Northern in particular, but also alongside its companion structures, is an outstanding example of a type of building, architectural and technological, that's an and or in UNESCO, it's and for us, um, and landscape which illustrates a significant stage in human history especially when we talk about this in, in, in concert with larger scales of food production um, and movement. And so I just wanna close with also a few examples to, to talk about you know, the future of this building, not just its past, um, because while there are certain uh, present challenges, um, there are now so many, I mean, what we benefit by in Buffalo, I think at this point in 2022, is that we have so many examples across the world in terms of the reuse and uh, productive adaptive reuse of so many of these structures. And one as close as Akron, New York, uh, excuse me, Akron, Ohio, I'm used to saying Akron, New York, um, uh, despite originally being an Ohioan, um, but Akron, Ohio, where uh, some of you might know this example from, uh, actually that's incorrect, 1932 is not correct, uh, uh, well it is for the grain elevator, excuse me, so the grain elevator, this complex is uh, located right at the edge of downtown Akron, Ohio, um, and in 1980 it was transformed into a hotel, and now I, I'm not showing these examples all as the most, you know, all as kind of uh, brilliant examples of, you know, what I think is the best architectural response, uh, but just as examples that also verify um, the kind of, um, you know, uh, <laughs> with certainty, the kind of um, uh, ability to transform these sites, and especially when located, uh, in this case, also kind of downtown and, and neighborhood adjacent, like ours in, in Buffalo. Um, actually, there is something, while of course its design is, is dated to 1980, there's something really um, beautiful about the concept here, because you know, the, that raw kind of um, uh, scalar monumental power of these buildings, um, you know, is sort of, there's a sacrifice made when you begin to punch balconies, right, and windows into these forms. But at the Quaker Square Inn, they actually do this, and again, this photo is another one where I want to take, and this, this, this time, like five steps to the right, um, where they actually load the balconies on one side so that five steps to the right, what you get is the unbroken, perfectly preserved line of cylinders, line of these silos. And so you get both and. You get the preservation of the image as it was and has existed for its you know, entire history. Oh, excuse me. And also then you get this kind of new insertion of, of adaptive reuse of building program. Um, here in Copenhagen, another example, this time just of two enormous concrete silos of a, a much larger scale, um, where the architecture, the, um, the Dutch architecture firm MVRDV, uh, actually took these and converted this into housing, but rather than fill, and so kind of as an answer to what we see at the Quaker Square Inn in some ways, rather than fill these uh, cylinders with housing, they actually decide to, and, and punched windows into it, they actually decide and, and, and 
ultimately create kind of awkward pie-shaped units. Um, they instead decide to hang, to cantilever units out from that perimeter wall. And so ultimately what you get is this transformation, which kind of turns it inside out, where it's not about preservation of the original image of the building as the concrete silos, although that's revealed at the base of the building. It's about the kind of preservation of the, the power of that vast interior cylinder of space um, as void. And so the interior of the building is preserved uh, with its uh, concrete, um, uh, with, with the access to the units, but preserved as this powerful cylindrical void of space at the center as opposed to filling it with, with uh, floor plates. Very Guggenheim-esque, too. Um, also in Copenhagen, uh, in some of its uh, industrial waterfront, um, you have this project, which takes a very monolithic silo building, more like our lake and rail here in Buffalo, which on the Buffalo River, which has this big monolithic concrete wall within which are silos. Um, and it also kind of hangs a new facade on the outside of that and then punches into it. Um, and this part of this larger landscape, these are all former wharfs um, uh, for uh, in the industrial port of Copenhagen. There's the center of the city here, um, where we see then the kind of transformation of that into an urban neighborhood. And this is the building that we're looking at, the former grain elevator. And so there's a, a before and after, um, uh, but quite a transformation. Again, just different approaches here, not to say any one is, is, in my opinion, better than the other, but just to kind of open our minds. I think what's so important here is to just generate a conversation about possibilities um, uh, and have the time and space afforded to do that, um, uh, regardless of any one individual idea or vision. Um, here, a, a very analogous case, because this is in Minneapolis, um, and Minnesota, a, another sister city in terms of the history of grain and flour production. Um, this is the, the gold medal flour complex in which its main mill, note this is Washburn, again, these are companies that are located in both uh, Buffalo and Minneapolis, its main mill building, uh, which closed in 1965, caught fire uh, in 1991 was almost entirely destroyed and, and essentially completely gutted, so much that just portions of the exterior wall remained. And so, uh, but nonetheless, you know, this building, which was certainly too far gone <laughs> by uh, the kind of, to use the, the term that a lot of, you know, uh, people throw around in terms of whether or not a structure can be saved or preserved in any form whatsoever, um, that was preserved as a ruin um, into which uh, was built a museum. And so this is then the opportunity, this kind of watershed moment for many Minneapolis, like I think we have with the Great Northern currently, to then begin to share this story on a kind of, you know, not only the local and regional scale, but also the national and international scale for visitors and tourists alike uh, coming to Minneapolis to understand its uh, important position uh, internationally in terms of, especially here, flower production. Um, and so that's now the Mill City Museum. And it's really a pretty spectacular space. There are weddings here in this, in this ruined uh, kind of forecourt um, and all kinds of you know, concerts and other events uh, that preserve the ruin just by stabilizing. You see the steel that just stabilizes the exterior walls into which is built a modern building with its uh, glass curtain wall. Um, but also the inside, as you move through the museum and building, part of what's being exhibited is just the kind of artifacts, the remnants of its former uh, industrial interior. And so you're getting both exhibitions that situate that in that broader context, like I'm trying to do a bit tonight, uh, but also then through the power of having these, um, these kind of remnants as part of the circuit through the museum as you move through its spaces. Um, here, in one of, I think, the most spectacular examples, this is the Zolverein uh, coal uh, complex in uh, Essen, Germany, which is effectively the sort of rust belt of Germany, if you will. Um, and this entire site was actually listed with UNESCO as a World Heritage Site in 2001, actually just under two criterion, where I think we meet three. Um, and this site now has been, it's actually an incredible complex, much more directly also evidencing the influence of, of the previous generation of industrial architecture on a, by looking at the date 28 to 32, now kind of um, uh, moving forward uh, this kind of distinctly modern international style vision of, that's borrowed and extending the language of industrial architecture here back into industrial architecture. Um, but it's a pretty spectacular complex, but one of the main buildings, which is the coal washing building, um, has been turned into a museum. And that's the Rohr Museum. And that museum, and again, for people that this is Essen, this is not Berlin, this is not 
Hamburg, this is not Munich. You know, it's not one of the, you know, uh, the, the most heavily touristed cities in, uh, in the context of, of Germany. Um, this is, again, the Rust Belt of Germany, if you will. Um, this museum has seen uh, more than two million visitors since opening to the public in 2010, in its first 10 years of existence. And so it's become an enormous draw. And part of that, and, and what also I think is amazing about this complex is that even though it's UNESCO listed, that doesn't mean that contemporary, you know, um, uh, interventions can't happen within that context. And so here you see the architecture firm OMA, the Office for Metropolitan Architecture, who many of you might know is the, the firm that is um, that has designed the expansion to the Albright Knox Art Museum under construction just across the way. Um, and so here at the Rohr Museum, they kind of extended this language of conveyors as this enormous kind of grand escalator that takes you up as the entrance to the museum. And so you actually move up the escalator and the lobby is actually at the top floor um, of the building. And so this is the experience moving into the building really kind of transplanting you and your human experience as the coal, you know, in this kind of industrial um, and kind of placing you more in direct context of the memory of the movements uh, and circulation that happened in this building in its former life as a site of industry. Um, and here's some of those exhibits, much like we also see at the Mill City Museum Complex in, um, in Minneapolis. You see the kind of retainment of all of the uh, kind of artifacts of the, uh, the coal washing um, that exists as you move through. And some spaces are much more kind of, you know, um, uh, simplified as, as, as kind of, you know, just pure gallery spaces and, and artifact display spaces. But in and amongst that, you have still also the kind of chutes and conveyors and elevators for, uh, for coal. And then some of these spaces where no exhibits happen at all. All, but you just pass through on your way from one to another um, where you get the kind of power of that industry. And there you see another historic piece of that that is much like what they've done with the entry uh, escalator. And also then the landscape has been a big part of this project. And so Agents Tear, uh, a, a landscape architecture firm, has completely redesigned the surrounding landscape of this coal uh, facility. And so it also functions as an enormous public park, much like what we are conceptualizing about and, and building with our outer harbor today ice skating, of course. <laughs> um, and this is a more recent example. This is just completed in 2021 where an existing silo and industrial complex has been expanded. And so this is entirely new construction here on the left. But notice how that's picking up very directly on the language and building off of the existing facility uh, uh, as an extension to, as an art museum, re, uh, rehabbing these industrial spaces and a uh, former grain elevator. And so this is the experience cutting across some of these catwalks that have been inserted as you move through some of these large extant voids of the grain elevator as you go from the kind of old gallery spaces in the factory building to the new gallery spaces through the silos as the kind of mediator between these two museum spaces. There's what that, that's what the experience is like across the catwalk. Notice steel construction, much like what we have at the Great Northern. So these are steel bends, uh, steel cylindrical bends, riveted steel boilerplate. Um, and this also an example of, uh, you know, post, and this is of course a, a historic photo of the industry in Dunkirk in France. Um, this is the building we'll be looking at uh, where now the, the presence of that industry is, uh, this site is no longer active. Um, this is a former boat warehouse that where instead of filling this space, what this architect, Lacaton and Vassal, who are um, since Pritzker Prize winning architects, uh, French architects, uh, Anne Lacaton was actually here in Buffalo a few years back and lectured. Um, but what they did was actually then double the form of the building. So rather than just inhabit and adaptively repurpose the building in its bones, they actually kind of created a, a second ghost of it um, as a twin that then functions better to stuff all of the contemporary programs into. Um, and so that they allowed then this space to be preserved as this large warehouse space um, only to then kind of occupy all the traditional programs uh, within this kind of twin uh, along its side, replicating the building form, but also clearly, you know, defining something that is contemporary of the 21st century alongside that of the previous. Um, and this contrast of heaviness and lightness, which I also think is interesting considering the Great Northern and that kind of extreme monolithic heavy quality of the existing building. Um, and you get these fabulous views of what is left of the industrial landscape of the harbor of Dunkirk from the top floors of the building. Um, and this one, a kind of a curious example, which is actually an archival storage building, which by necessity of program uh, for this state in Germany uh, is windowless. And so they occupy this historic building, but extend an archive tower stacks um, through that 
but rather than just kind of brick it up uh, entirely, this is a new opportunity to kind of express further the monumentality and monolithic quality of the form, uh, working for this new program, but then allowing this kind of new brick that exists as a vehicle for pattern. And so it becomes this incredibly kind of decorous pattern work in brick as a complement to the kind of um, uh, structural rigidity uh, and tightness of the existing brick building. And last but not least, maybe one you've seen that's most re that's uh, uh, also very quite recent, 2000, uh, uh, the, this is actually a complex that started design in 2011, opened more recently. But this is a, a grain elevator complex in Cape Town in South Africa, uh, in which case the kind of head house um, has been re-inhabited and uh, this is a multi uh, kind of use program uh, in an urban site, uh, but the grain elevators actually were voided with this kind of, um, uh, this, this large scale uh, void within the building where you still get the retainment of those forms, but a kind of new way of interpreting these cylinders because always the challenge with some of these is how do you occupy occupy these cylinders that were never designed to be occupied for humans, right? Um, and so lots of different and interesting examples of still kind of altering but still maintaining as a kind of concept of preservation the kind of uh, the, you know, the, the weight of this building and, it, and its history and sort of making us see that anew uh, in a way that captures our attention. So I'm sorry for going a little bit over, but <laughs> that's, uh, that's where I'll end. Um, and hopefully that gives you kind of a sense of, of not only the past, but some of the opportunities that I think are currently uh, where I'd love to see more of the conversation taking place around the future of the Great Northern. Thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think that what I'm also trying to show in, in all of the examples that I showed of adaptive reuse, none of those are industrial reuses. But I also, you know, it, it is an interesting question at least to say, well, what does an industrial future of this building look like? You know, it's, it's, I think what's important is asking these questions and generating the conversation and dialogue, uh, whether that's for ADM or, you know, it, you know, what would it look like for this building to be a kind of profitable, you know, um, uh, uh, project for ADM, you know? I think that nothing in my eyes is off the table other than demolition. <laughs> um, but uh, so I, you know, I think that's an interesting question. And, and just given the broad range of different examples of um, actually not just kind of purely thinking in a restorative sense and sort of trapping the building in what it was in 1897, uh, but thinking about this as a site of evolution as also this site that is entirely in the spirit of this landscape, right? We've seen it go through so many gen different generations of concepts about building and about industry and about about a, a, a place that, um, that I think this kind of tapping into the spirit of evolution is, is certainly also um, you know, a conversation to be had. So I think that you know, I just love to see that conversation um, uh, happen um, and I wouldn't consider anything off the table in that regard, uh, which could include still industrial use. I think that is the challenge. The example in Dunkirk, while it's not, um, its site is certainly cleared and, and now post-industrial, it is a pretty similar situation where so much of that port is still active industry. So you do get this mix of cultural landscape and active industrial landscape, um, which is a little bit analogous then to our site of the Outer Harbor, you know. Uh, but I also think looking at the, the longer future of this as a cultural landscape, you know, UNESCO listing, for example, doesn't preclude the opportunity for still industrial use. What it does is protect the future of this as a landscape for the future of Buffalo and for the world, right? So, um, uh, so I think that's an interesting, yeah, uh, definitely an interesting observation, of course, about the current condition of the site and a, qu a question about its future. Anything else? Well, thanks, everybody. Just I learned a lot. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>